today we're going to look at the reuse of symbols. So if I, I'm going to start out with the brush tool and black's just such a depressing color today. Even after watching Radiohead creep, it's still just a little bit depressing. So we need something a little more uplifting. So now if I draw a shape and remember one of the things that Flash does when you work is it does use kind of uh, an auto smoothing. So if I have a shaky hand, it tries to smooth it out. Now some people find this frustrating because it doesn't maintain the exact mark that you've drawn. Other people like the fact that we can see my hand is shaking a little bit as I go through and it's not really smooth and Flash helps smooth that out, but it also gives it a little bit more of a painted appearance versus looking like a computer crafted mark or line. So that's one of the things that I find very appealing working in Flash is that the marks, the lines it makes are, they don't look like they were produced on the computer, but they have that appearance of being hand painted or hand drawn. I'm also going to recommend that you avoid using the pencil tool unless you have a specific purpose or reason for doing so or were instructed to do so. So when you are creating something, if you're going to create an object, so if I wanted to create an apple or cherry or whatever it's going to be, using the paintbrush tool combined with if I need to clean up some edges I could use the eraser so I can get rid of that is going to be preferable to using well, let's uh, put the pencil back to a more reasonable size so if I use the pencil tool we can see it's I'm not getting that same kind of hand created artwork it looks more um, computer drawn but it's much easier to get nicer looking artwork if you use the brush <coughs> and now if I want to fill with the color I can fill with the color I could fill with the color using the paint bucket tool so I'm going to recommend that if you use the brush you're going to have better luck than using the pencil and more of that will become apparent down the road and it will also afford us a few more options and remembering when we looked at some of the Disney artwork where the outlines were colored we can get nicer coloring with the paintbrush than we often do with the pencil although I could choose and add a color in if I wanted. So using the paintbrush I am going to I'm going to create a very um, kind of pathetic flower uh, because I can. Now one thing about using the paint bucket tool, it is going to fill based on the gaps. So if I have drawn a shape and there's a gap, so there is a gap in the shape, it's not closed. When I use the paint bucket tool and try and fill, it won't fill. But you can choose to close small gaps, nope, it's not a small gap medium gap, no, large, and it still is a little bit too large, but if it's a, uh, that gap is narrower, and then I go to close, we can see it will fill. So with the paint bucket, you may need to modify the gap closure option if when you're trying to fill things, it doesn't want to fill. So that's just one little thing to be aware of with that. So now 
I'm going to say I want no stroke, choose a different fill color. I'm just going to put a circle. OK. So now I have my flower. I suppose it could use a stem, too. So yeah, grab a little green. So if I want to fill this stem, I do need to close it, at least partially. Now I can fill it. So now I have a flower. Now if I wanted to put a 100 flowers on screen, I could draw 100 flowers. But it's much easier if I use a symbol, because then I can reuse the same artwork. So I'm se selecting this, um, the selection tool. I'm choosing the selection tool. It sounds a little bit better. Highlight, drag across to select it. So if I click off, nothing selected. If I click and drag, it uses the rectangular marquee and it selects it. I could also use the lasso tool. And I could lasso that there flower and now it's selected. It puts a little hash pattern on it. Now, to convert something to a symbol, I select it. And if you look under Modify, you will see an option of Convert to Symbol. It also has an F key associated with it, F8. So we choose F8. So I can hit F8 on the keyboard. That's not the letter F plus the number 8. That's the F key, the top row of the keyboard, F8. Or I can go under Modify, Convert to Symbol. And now when I do that, it comes up and gives me a few options here. There are, I can choose where I want that symbol to be registered. The default is always the top left corner. It doesn't really matter for what we're doing right now where you register it. So I would say go ahead and leave it. Um, we have three types of symbols that we get to work with in Flash. Movie clip, button, and graphic. Unless you are instructed otherwise, I recommend you always use a movie clip. There will be times where you will want a graphic symbol, and I will instruct you appropriately. There will be times where you want a button. But otherwise, use a movie clip because if you don't, you will lose access to some of the cool extra things that we can do with artwork when it is a movie clip. So now I have. I'll choose Movie Clip. I'll give it a name. Now this name that I'm giving it is a name so I can identify it when it shows up in my library. Convention holds that the name begins with an uppercase letter. It's also a good practice to only use letters, numbers, and underscore in your naming. This is part of because we are dealing with web technologies and eventually with programming languages. It requires our names to use letters, numbers, and underscore our permissible characters. You can sometimes get away with a hyphen. Now my recommendation is to start with, well you must start with the letter and convention holds we start with an uppercase like this. Now I can hit OK. And now we'll see that that flower has a box around it when it's selected. I can move it around. Now I have a library that's part of my project here. Here's the library. And we can see there is flower. Now here's the fun part. If I want a second flower, I can drag it out from the library. If I want a third flower, so it's my little uh, flower factory here. I can just keep dragging them out. Now, each one of these flowers that I've drug out are an instance of this library symbol. So they are an instance. They are not that library symbol. They're an instance of that symbol. Now, each one of these can actually, if I grab the transform tool, I could make them different sizes. 
I can rotate them. I can squish them. So they're all based on that same library symbol. Now if I d double click on the symbol icon in the library, looking at the top of the screen you'll see where it says scene one and then flower. It tells me I'm inside the flower symbol. Now this flower symbol, if I decide that, well, I really don't like that red in the middle, I want it to be something else, so I'll choose a different color. Let's go for like light peach and click that there. Well, notice how it updated the symbol. Now if I go back to scene one, all of them have been updated because all of these flowers are just simply an instance or a copy of that flower symbol that exists in my library. And because these are movie clip symbols, I have a number of options available to me. I have 3D position, I have color effect, I have display options, and I even have filters. So the filters, when I look here, down at the very bottom left corner, I can click add filter and choose what kind of filter I want. So I could say, oh, I don't know, I could put a drop shadow on this flower and boom, it gets a drop shadow. I could go to this one and I could click and say I want this one to have a, a glow on it and now choose how much of a glow and we'll make it bigger so we can see that now it's got a glow. So we can apply filters to these symbols. Now you'll notice that this one is on top of this one but they're all on one layer. If I want to adjust objects on a given layer. So if I want this flower to be on top of the others, the first one I did, modify, arrange, and now we have bring to front, bring forward, bring backwards, send to back. So we have different options. So I could say bring to front, boom, now this one's on top. And we can even modify the color on that one. We'll give it a different tint, not white, let's give it, it's a sad flower, it's kind of blue. sad because spring is threatening to be here but you know I bet we're gonna get a snowstorm in a week don't it feels like summer but you know I we're due for one more snowstorm motion tweening means we can animate very easily so with this layer here if I choose create motion tween, what you'll notice is with that object selected, it put it onto its own layer. One of the key things, and I'm going to undo that, about using motion tweens is it requires one layer per object. Now, I could manually tween this where I could add in a keyframe and the key command for doing that is F6 so that makes a copy of the current one all of those flowers are there now I can move them to new positions hit F6 again and move them F6 again move them F6 again move them so we can see that I'm animating you know the group ooh look at that so I've inserted all these keyframes but if I want to, say, make them kind of move at a different speed or adjust this location, I have to go back to each frame and adjust it. Motion tweening allows you to be much more economical with what you're doing. But the caveat is it's one object per layer. Because a motion tween can only handle one object at a time because that tween that it's going to create is tied to one object. It can't say, oh, I have these, this object moving left, this object moving right, this one getting bigger, this one getting smaller, it's not going to work. Unless each is on its own layer. So what I am going to do is add a new layer and drag out another copy of the flower and put it here. And now if I right click on the flower or right click in the timeline, it gives me an option of create motion tween. 
So, and I'm sure under some pull down menu I can get to it as well. So now I have a motion tween. Now if I look close, I will notice that the layer doesn't have the little page icon anymore. It's got the little kind of trails. So it looks like a little square with trails. It also now is blue. If we notice it's not the standard gray, but it's blue. The blue indicates it's a motion tween. And now here's how easy it is to animate that. I can just move this here and now I put a little diamond in instead of an actual the circle with a frame. Now if I'm at this frame, let's use it, this flower here, another one. So we can see now, and I'm going to just turn off this layer and change my color here so it's easier to see. So this line indicates the path that that flower is following. So now it's following that path. All I did was move its end, move it in the middle, and if I have more time to play with, oh wait, look at my animation just got longer, and all I did was drag it out. So I didn't have to add in a whole bunch more keyframes, I can just make it longer, can make it shorter, and then I can go here and move it to a new location. We can see it automatically is now showing that new path of movement new path of movement and all the little black dots on this path correspond to frames on the timeline frame 1, 2, 3, 4, blah 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 all the way to 45 so we can see it now corresponds to it even better when the artwork is selected with the selection tool I can even go to this path pull on it change it for those of you who are Illustrator users used to working with Bezier paths with handles, I can even insert or you know click on a point in that path and get the handles and work with it. Adjusting the animate whoa, sorry. Adjusting the movement of the animation. So to get an object to move in a curve frame by frame style is a considerable amount of work. To get an object to move on a curve through a motion tween is super easy. So I'm going to repeat the process by adding a new layer and I've had enough with the flowers so I'm going to just create something. I'm just going to create a ball. So to convert it to a symbol, highlight it, F8, so after something is a motion tween, that point, so I'm now on this layer. Now, if I look at my layers, one, three, four, five, eventually when you get 50 layers, if you don't start naming your layers, you're going to get really lost. So I really am a big advocate for naming your layers. And you can do that by just double clicking on the text in the layer and type in what you want. So this is my flowers. This is my flower. And this was the first ball. I don't want that one anymore, so I'll just get rid of it. Now for my other one. Now currently this is a motion tween layer we can see by its icon and it's blue. It's 24 frames long which corresponds to the length of my movie is 24 frames per second. When you add a motion tween to a single frame layer it will default to one second of animation. That's what it does. But if I want it longer or shorter all I have to do is put my cursor on O hover over the last frame in the animation. It gives me the kind of icon to indicate it. I can adjust its time duration and I can just drag it out longer or shorter. Now if I move this over here, it's now tweened it. Smooth motion. I can guarantee I will get a project from someone that will at some point try and replicate that same movement where they will then go through and go F6, 
move it, F6, move it, F6, move it, F6, move it, F6, move it, F6, move it. Now I didn't have to redraw every frame, but boy, that's a lot of work to move it over and it's hard to make it smooth. And look how smooth the uh, tweened layer is. And if I want the tween layer to take the same amount of time, I can do that and look at now. I can see how much easier it is to use a tween versus adding in a keyframe and moving it. But the real advantage of the tween is if I decide my path should curve, it's now curving. And then if I go into the middle of that animation, grab the transform tool and click on my object and So I can tween my scale, tween my position. So using tweening is a significantly more flexible approach. If you're going to add a keyframe for every little nick of movement, just hand draw all of it. Don't even use symbols at that point. Be a true glutton for punishment, but know that you will get hand-drawn animation, frame by frame, onion skin style is beautiful when it's done well. It also takes a ridiculous amount of time to pull off. So I would encourage you to be cautious with that. So we have keyframes, we have tweens. You have frames on those tweens. You can make it longer or shorter by just dragging it as you see fit. If you make it longer, it slows the animation down. If you make it shorter, the animation happens fast. Know that 24 frames defaults to one second, so when you start planning out your movement, plan accordingly so that you don't end up with everything happening too quickly. So work on developing that timing of your animation of how long does something need to move? How long does it need to be on screen? How long should it take while it moves around for us to watch it? So the question has come up, how can I blur filter effects? So I'm going to turn off those layers, start with a fresh layer there and if I start with a flower here now this flower create motion tween and if I want the flower it's not going to move but it's going to start out blurred so I go under properties now notice if I click in the timeline I get access to timeline properties the tween itself if I click on the artwork, I gain access to the artwork. Now under filters, if I want to say start with a blur, I'm going to blur this. So our flower is really, oh shoot, I wasn't at frame, whoa. Forgot to uh, rewind my playback, head to frame one. So I want to start here, click on the artwork, blur it. If I go here, click on the artwork, blur it down to zero, and we'll see that over the course of 55 frames, the flower comes into focus. So you can actually use that kind of technique to simulate the film effect of doing, say, a rack focus visual change or point of interest change within the given frame. So. Uh, filter is tweenable in the same way that I could now also make the flower getting smaller like this 
So we can see flower starts out fuzzy and tall and now it shrinks down and comes into focus. So I can tween my scale, filter, and it is even possible to individually tween and add keyframes for individual properties of an object as well, but we're not going to get into that at the moment. We'll just you know, work with what you have here and you should be in good shape. Now, something that's important to keep in mind is that I've turned off these other layers, but when I do publish my movie, which is under Control, Test Movie, Test, which is also Command, Enter, Command, Return, all layers that were turned off become visible again. So that is something to keep in mind. So if you turn off layers and go, whoa, it showed up and I don't want it to be there anymore, what you need to do, oh, keep missing. What you need to do is to not delete the layer. If it's a layer that you're like, well, I want it, but I don't want to delete it, but I don't want it to show. We can change a layer and make it into a guide layer. A guide layer is just simply that. It's a guide, but it won't publish with the project. So if whatever was on this layer, so this one here, we don't want that. If I double click on the layer icon, I can say guide. Instead of normal, it's now a guide. Hit OK, boom. It changes the icon, puts a little T-square icon next to it, and that means then it won't publish with it when I run my movie, so that layer is now gone. So you can see that the top red circle is not appearing anymore. It's still there. All of its artwork is still there. We can't see it. I also recommend while you are working, whatever layer that you are not actively using, lock. So you don't accidentally add artwork to the wrong layer, change a layer, do something, always lock whatever layers that you're not working with currently. And if you don't need to see them, turn them off. That's a really useful technique to prevent heartache, frustration, and to keep your anger management in check. So I really do recommend lock layers, turn off layers when you're not using them. For the anal-retentive type who likes to have everything organized, you can also add folders, and you can organize your layers by folders. So when you start getting 20, 30, 50 layers, it can be easier to start putting them into folders. If you're not one of those types who cares about that, don't worry. If you are, you already probably know how to use them. It works just like folders in Photoshop and Illustrator and InDesign. It's the same sort of thing. So if you're that kind of person, go ahead and use them. If you don't care, don't bother. So when bringing in music and pictures into Flash, to do so, we need to import them. That's under the File pull-down menu, Import. Now, currently, the layer that is active is a motion tween layer which will not allow me to add any additional artwork to it, so the only option Flash is giving me is import to library, which is okay. It's okay. If I had a plain, normal layer, I could see import to stage as an option. Audio only goes into the library, and then we assign audio to a specific frame in the project, which we'll cover that process in just a moment. So I'm going to just import to library, and it thinks for a moment, and it comes up, and now I can choose my stuff. Here's my picture of Tom Cruise. Here's my audio. It is possible to shift select multiple items and import more than one item at a time. When you are bringing in images, and we will look at this next week, it's possible to bring in a layered Photoshop file, so a layered PSD. You do not have to export the layers of your PSD into separate pieces. You can bring it in as one complete piece, and it will maintain the registration of all the assets of that PSD file. So we'll look at that 
specifically. So here's music, here's a picture. I'll hit open, boom. I can now see there they are, they showed up in my library. If I want to do something with them, if I want to take this picture and put it in my project, it will say, oh, can't put that because this is a tween. Look at the layer icon, look at its color, it's blue. I can't put objects on that. So I'm going to add a new layer. Name it. Go put Tom on it. You can see there he is. Now, if I want to do anything to him, work with it, well, notice I don't get access to color, 3D, filters, any of that, because he is not a movie clip. So I need to convert him to a symbol if I want to start working with him or do anything other than just plop it on the stage. So to do that, with it selected, I hit F8 on the keyboard. Give it a name, start with a capital letter, no spaces. There we go. Now that he's a symbol, we get access to all of those symbol things. And, well, let's... Um, I'm just going to hit him with a nice healthy blur. So he's been blurred. Grand motion tween. At the end. Get rid of the blur. So now we can see that he starts out and comes into focus. Ooh. Fancy. So I've brought in a basic picture. If I wanted it to move or change or animate, I could work with that. Now, if I take this picture, grab transform here. Make it bigger. Well, notice that at its larger size that it got pixelated. It brought the picture in at full resolution. Because it was a crappy web picture, when I make it bigger, we can see that all it did was make each one of the pixels bigger, and it looks kind of junky. So if you are going to be scaling artwork up, or if you need it big at some point, that should be the size you should bring it in. Don't bring it in small and make it bigger because it will look crappy. It will get all pixelated and junky. When you're using bitmap artwork, always bring it in at the largest size it will ever appear in your animation. And when you shrink it down, it looks fine. But then when it goes big, it's not going to look like crap. Audio should always go onto its own layer. Audio is a property of a frame. So if I click on a frame, not artwork, but on a frame, I will see I have access to sound. If I go and click on Tom, there's no sound here is that I'm on an instance of Tommy, that movie clip. But if I click on this frame, there's sound. And if I click under sound, I can see, hey, look, there's the sound I imported. Click on that. You can see it shows up in the timeline. Now, the one thing that I'm going to find is that this particular sound was 15 seconds long. So if I hit play right now, it's going to start playing and it will play out in its entirety for 15 seconds. So I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to test movie and watch something else happen that is far more interesting. <laughs> So when we're working with the audio, we might want to modify the sync option. Now start will mean it, will, it won't start playing a new copy of the sound until the current one is done. So now if I change it from event to start and test <laughs> So we can hear that the sound hasn't overlapped even though it's cycled three or four times. The animation cycle, but it's not recycling. The other one that we'll probably use most often is stream. Stream has an added bonus. 
when I scrub the timeline, I can actually hear the sound. And if I play and stop, it doesn't keep playing in its entirety. And I'm avoiding hitting play from frame one with event or start because it will now, there's no way I can stop the sound at that point. It's going to play off 15 seconds. But if I test the movie. <laughs> So what we can see is the animation, every time it loops, the audio is looping as well. So it makes the audio linked to the frames of the animation much like the audio track is linked to the video track when you're doing video editing. So it gives you that connection as part of it. So I'm going to recommend that most of the time when you're working with the audio, you set it to stream short things like sound effects and stuff like that there you might be able to get away just leave it at um, event and be done with it now under window common libraries I actually have access to sounds flash has a whole library of built-in sounds that I can access so here are different sounds you can see it's a pretty uh, substantial list well, that's not very exciting. Weapon staff hit body fast. Hmm. It's not really a machine gun unless I put a whole bunch of them together. All right, so if I'll use that. So if I try and drag the sound out, we can see if I drag it to the stage, it adds it to that frame as part of it, but the sound isn't really on the stage. Okay, so there's the sound. If I look in my library, there's now a copy of the sound in my library. The sound is 51 frames long. So it happens my project is just long enough to kind of show it in its entirety. If I want multiple versions of that to play and just click on this frame here there it is I could now even drag that so it staggers it a little bit up to uh, close so now it starts to give us the sound of more than one. So you could put in multiple ones and actually create a machine gun sound if you stack them. Now you probably would need to use multiple layers, multiple keyframes, and you could you know, work it out to get it so it actually sounds like rapid fire machine gun if that was your goal or aim as part of what you were doing. But adding in sound, adding in pictures, is not really any more complex than working with artwork created directly in Flash. But it is recommended that when you are motion tweening, use the symbol, preferably a movie clip, unless you're told otherwise. There will be times where we will use other kinds of symbols, and we will look at that. But in general, make it a movie clip, and then you will have better luck with it. So to get my sound to continue on my music layer, if I click out here and hit F5, it extends out and now I can go longer and because the flash timeline, it doesn't give you just kind of like, you can't just keep scrolling to infinity, but if you add frames, then it gives you more frames that you can kind of scrub out to and make something longer and make something longer. But currently that apparently is more, so my music is only, oh, because it's 15 seconds long. Or, well, it's got a little bit of tail on it. But, yeah, so right here at the end of the music, it's 15 seconds, then it just kind of has about three seconds of emptiness at the end. I don't know why, but it does. So if my music were longer, then it would continue. And if I scrub to the end here and go, I need more frames, 
I can then just scrub out and hit F5 again. And then now suddenly I have more frames I can scrub out and keep going. I have lots of frames to get rid of. And again, to get rid of those, since I don't want those for these demo, highlighting, blah, 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 blah. I could have used a shift click thing, click on that one end and go, I don't want to. Shift F5, go away, 